Um, <laughs> I, yeah, so I just want to make it very clear to everyone, I am here um, as a CMS alum today and not <laughs> representing any organization that I may or may not currently work for. Um, <laughs> so I want to thank you for inviting me to talk. I'm really excited to be here. I'm actually a lot, I'm more nervous today than I ever was as a student, so I don't know what that says. Um, but this is a really great um, opportunity. I really encourage all of you to participate. If you don't participate next year, you should participate, or this year you should participate next year. It's a very welcoming audience. You get really good feedback um, in a, you know, nice, productive, constructive way. So um, without any further ado, I'm going to expand on this introduction a little bit. Um, kind of a fun thing, I was going back looking through pictures and I couldn't really find any from my time here. And I think it's because I was here before the age of smartphones. Um, so I didn't have a lot of pictures. Is there a laser pointer? How do I use this? Just the top one? No. Sorry, which one is it? Okay. The little one. Right? The little one. Okay, perfect. Um, so here I am. I'm here. This is my uh, time here at College of Marine Science. I came to the College of Marine Science through an official internship program. I did my bachelor's degree at Eckerd College here in St. Petersburg. And um, back in 2004, there was actually a formal internship agreement between the College of Marine Science and Eckerd College. And it was a great synergistic program. Um, the College of Marine Science received interns from Eckerd. College of Marine Science didn't have an undergraduate program. Eckerd didn't have a graduate program. So it worked really well. Um, it was a good marriage between the two. Um, the USGS also used to have a program with Eckerd College, but they no longer do it. I don't, I don't know if you guys still have the formal internship or not, but I know you can um, work with Eckerd undergraduates. So I was an Eckerd College undergraduate. I did an internship in the summer of 2004 here um, with Dr. David Hollander and um, a former student, Heather Hill. I really liked what I was doing and I was able to turn that research into an undergraduate senior thesis. Um, and then when I finished my undergraduate work, I came here and I expanded on that research. I continue to do it. Um, I do have a slide further on the presentation. I was able to put my whole master's thesis into one slide. Um, that was a challenge, but here I am. Do any of you recognize these? Probably not. I found this fun picture. Those are Soxlet extractors up in the organic geochemistry lab. Um, you guys will probably never have to use them. I painfully Soxlet extracted every one of my sediment samples, and then the year I left, you guys got the ACE, so you guys are lucky. Um, here I am presenting some of my um, master's research at a conference in London. And then these are just some of the things I've done um, since I've been at the USGS. So when I finished here, I went over and started working um, at the USGS Coastal Marine Science Center here in St. Pete, which is where I've been for the past 10 years. All right, so climate change. I study climate change. Why is it important to study climate change? Um, I think everyone in this room understands why we need to study climate change. Um, Throughout the past, there have been lots of periods of floods, there have been lots of periods of droughts. Um, unfortunately, the observational record doesn't really extend prior to about 1850. So if we want to understand natural climate variability prior to 1850, we need to use um, the geologic record and use geologic proxies to try to understand how the climate has changed over the past few um, millennia. This is just a figure from the IPCC report. Um, as you can see, this is what the climate has been historically. And then these are just different scenarios as to what the climate may or may not do, depending on um, what type of action we take to mitigate our influence on climate. So here is what I did. This is my one slide of my entire thesis while I was here at College of Marine Science. I had a sediment core. This was a box core that was collected in 2003 um, from the Pygmy Basin in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, basically, what we wanted to do was we wanted to try to um, reconstruct Mississippi River discharge that was coming off of the continent into the Pygmy Basin in the Gulf of Mexico. We used a suite of high resolution um, organic proxies in order to do this. My core 
went back about 2,000 years before present, so it was a really long core. We were able to get um, 2,000 years of climate history, and each sample represented about 10 years, so um, that's really high resolution for sediment cores. I Soxlet extracted all of my samples um, to extract out the organic compounds. Specifically, I was looking at high molecular weight and alkanes, so C25, C27. Um, this is one carbon. The chains I was looking at had 25 carbons and 27 carbons. Those um, high molecular weight and alkanes are synthesized exclusively in the leaf waxes of terrestrial plants. So therefore, the theory was if they're in marine sediments, they had to be transported in um, basically by the R Mississippi River. Um, so that's what I did. And we found uh, there should have been things. Got, I apologize right now if anything looks weird in this presentation. I had to use an old version of PowerPoint to put this presentation together. Um, since I wasn't technically allowed to use my work computer. Um, so things might have gotten lost in translation a little bit. Um, but as you can see, there are pulses here. So um, the higher the pulse, the more terrestrial input from the continent in the um, core. And you can see right here and right here. Um, and that's when we hypothesized that there was some flooding going on in the Mississippi River Basin. Um, so that was my master's thesis in a nutshell. Um, if anyone has any more questions about that, you can ask me about it after. Um, so then after I left the College of Marine Science here, I went over to the USGS and I switched gears a little bit. Um, I started looking at more recent climate history. Instead of the past 2,000 years, I wanted to look at the past 200 years. Um, this is another really nice figure from the IPCC report. This is just um, several different um, records of global temperature. I really want to draw your eye to this region right here, about 1970 to present. Um, and you can see this really nice 0.4 degrees Celsius warming. This record, this black record right here, is a record of both um, its global temperature and its combination of land and ocean temperature. Um, and you can see there are multiple records here. They all um, agree pretty well. Um, this top panel here is also another record of um, sea surface temperature anomalies, and they all show this pretty rapid warming um, in the past like 30 or 40 years or so. This is a, just a nice um, figure of some sea level rise and sea level change, greenhouse gas emissions, anthropogenic CO2. So all of these um, uh, proxies are agreeing with each other and they're showing that something's going on in the past 30 or 40 years that's causing the sea surface temperature to rise. So I talked about sediments. I've switched gears. Now I work with corals. So most of you are probably familiar with um, dendrochronology. So dendrochronology is the study of using tree rings um, to reconstruct climate. And tree rings, as they grow, exhibit annual banding. Um, and we all know this, and you can count the bands of a tree ring and, or a tree if you cut it. You can count the bands and you can figure out how old the tree was when you cut it. Um, corals, you can do the exact same thing. Corals are um, a really cool <coughs> climate archive. Uh, the study of using corals as a climate archive is called sclerochronology. Um, and corals, much like trees, also ex um, produce annual growth bands, annual density bands. So if you know what year your corals were collected, you can use that. For instance, this coral is a modern coral. It was collected in 2008. You can count back all of the bands from 2008 on the x-ray and calculate um, how long ago that coral was still growing. Another nice thing about corals is they grow really large. For reference, there's a diver right here. Um, so we're able to get long, nice climate archives from coral reefs. To further expand on some scler um, the study of sclerochronology, we use the calcium carbonate of coral skeletons to reconstruct environmental changes over time. So as I said before, they have nice annual banding, which provides excellent chronology control 
we're able to create a very nice age model from the banding on the x-rays. They're long-lived. We can get records back several hundred years, depending on how large the coral um, colony is at the time of collection. Um, Atlantic corals grow really fast, which is to our advantage, because the faster the coral grows, the more skeleton it puts down, the more we can get we can get more samples per year that way. So we can get higher resolution. Some can't, excuse me, some corals we can get down to monthly or even higher resolution than that. Um, another thing about corals, um, oxygen isotopes. Um, when you look at the oxygen isotope of a coral skeleton, you can back calculate water temperature, but sometimes that can vary as a function of the oxygen isotope of seawater, which is primarily um, representative of salinity. So that can confound your results sometimes. So the better proxy to use if you just want to look at sea surface temperature over time is to use the relationship of um, strontium to calcium to reconstruct water temperature. And I'm going to get into that further in a minute. Um, our study site. Our study site is the Dry Tortugas National Park in Florida. So here we are here. And Dry Tortugas is that little box right there. It's about 100 kilometers west of Key West, Florida. Um, this is a really great spot to study climate change because it has a very nice open ocean setting. It's very far from anthropogenic input. Um, not a lot of people. You can go there. You can take a ferry over there, but no one lives there, so um, you don't have a lot of uh, anthropogenic factors that you might have in other places. Um, this map just shows the um, climatological significance of the dry tortugas. Basically, what we did here was we took the Hattie data, SST data site and um, correlated it with um, great gridded data points of SST throughout um, the Atlantic. And as you can see, the dry tortugas sea surface temperature <laughs> correlates really well and is significant at the 95 or 90, sorry, excuse me, 99% confidence interval um, throughout the Gulf of Mexico up through the, and up through the Gulf Stream, um, which is going to be important later on in the talk. We were able to go out to the Dry Tortugas several times over the past 10 years. Um, we were able to collect Orbicella faviolata samples um, in 2008. 8 and 2012, and we were also able to collect um, another species, Sideraster sideria, in 2008 and 2012. Um, the corals of the dry tortugas are just, they're beautiful, they grow very large, they're very nice looking, and we're able to get a lot of good climate information from them. So you're probably asking yourself, how on earth do they go out and collect this material? Um, I like pictures, I'm a picture person. So what we do is we identify a nice um, large coral that we think we would want to study. And we take a hydraulic drill and divers go out and use the hydraulic drill to core into the coral colonies that we want to study. They take a nice coral core out, so that's what it looks like. Um, when we get back to the lab, that's what the coral cores look like. They span several centuries. They, the divers fill the hole with cement, and then they put some donated live tissue on top, um, just in case anyone's interested. Um, we, so it, it looks like we don't actually damage the coral. Um, corals face enough issues with coral bleaching and things like that. We don't want to hurt them anymore. I also should stress that we, it is very hard to get permits and we have proper permits to do all of this work. If you go out and try to do this, you will probably get arrested. So um, <laughs> don't do it without a permit. Um, so this is what it looks like immediately after drilling and this is what it looks like about a year, uh, one year later. So we're not really damaging the corals, um, the coral material that we take to study. All right, this next slide is a little bit of an aside. I wouldn't normally put this in a talk, but I wanted to stress this because some of you students may not know um, that there is a scanning electron microscope here. Tony Greco teaches a class. It is located in KRC. Um, I took his class about, let's see, six years ago. Um, so I do all of the SEM work for my group at um, USGS. Um, we scan our corals using um, SEM 
to look for any evidence of diagenesis. Um, diagenesis is simply described as any physical, chemical, or biological change to the coral skeleton that, that may cause an artificial um, sea surface temperature reconstruction. Um, so this is an extreme close-up of one of my coral samples. Um, this is a nice a nice looking sample. It's very clean. There's no evidence of secondary um, precipitation or any calcite in filling. So corals are made of the mineral aragonite. It's a form of calcium carbonate. Um, it has a different strontium calcium signature than calcite. So we want to make sure that the corals are pristine and that we're putting good material into our machines and getting good numbers out. So I highly encourage the students here to look into that. If you think that you're going to be doing any sort of um, work where you want to do close-up imaging of your samples. You can take the SEM class. Um, you learn a lot. It's really great. And then you can use the SEM for your work. All right, reconstructing climate variability. So once we get those long cores back to the lab, the first thing we do is x-ray them, which I showed you some x-rays earlier in the talk. And then here's a nice x-ray as well. Um, I actually drill each coral with a dental drill. So it's the same type of drill that your dentist would use to drill your teeth to fill a cavity. Um, I might start moonlighting as a dentist if anyone needs any dental work. I'm pretty good at it. Um, but what we do is we, t we use the dental drill and we collect very small samples of coral powder. We make sure that we want to stay um, along a coral wall while we drill. So corals build their skeletons similar to how you would build a skyscraper. So you do walls, floors, walls, floors, walls, floors, so on, so on, so on. Um, the floors are laid down at a different time than the walls are. So when you drill, it's really important to stay on a wall just so that you're consistent in time and you're not incorporating any extra material that might skew um, your data one way or another. So that's me with our drilling system, drilling a coral. Um, the program that we use, uh, we're able to get, um, depending on the coral, between 12 and 15 samples per year. So in some instances, we're actually getting um, less than monthly res resolution, um, which is really awesome. Um, let's go back to Chemistry 101. The proxy that I use to reconstruct sea surface temperature using these corals is strontium to calcium. So, strontium and calcium are both located in the second column of the periodic table. That means that they exhibit similar properties. So sometimes, depending on the temperature of the seawater, the coral will substitute strontium in place of calcium in its calcium carbonate skeleton. Um, and if we understand this, there's a th thermodynamic relationship that causes this to happen. It's an inverse relationship. Um, it was first noted back in 1969 by Kinsman and Holland, um, and we were able to recreate it um, back in 2013, this very nice inverse relationship between strontium calcium and sea surface temperature. This was our calibration that we did um, on data from 1992 to 2008, where we regressed strontium calcium against sea surface temperature and got a very nice inverse relationship. And then, once you have a modern calibration, you can apply it to a down core record. So, in this slide, I had two coral colonies two different species. I had a Sideroastria sideria, and I had an Orbicella faviolata. Orbicella used to be called Montastria. Some people still interchange the two. Um, I typically just try to be consistent and call Orbicella, but every once in a while I'll slip and call it Montastria. Um, so here I had my two corals, my Sideroastria and my, my Orbicella. I almost just slipped. And um, I microsampled them with my dental drill. I collected the powder. I ran the samples um, for strontium calcium using ICP OES, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry, over at the USGS. Um, and I calibrated each strontium calcium record to its SST um, um, temperatures 
using the calibration equation discussed in the last slide for Orbicella, because I actually did that. And then there was another calibration um, that was done previously on Sideraster sideria, so I used that calibration. So each coral species was calibrated using an independent species-specific species calibration. And this is what we found. So Sideraster sideria is on top in the pink. Um, the x-axis is year, the y-axis um, I have the strontium calcium values on one side, and then I have the corresponding sea surface temperature um, on the other side. Anything up is warm. So the Sideraster sideria, we were able to get back to 1833. Sideraster um, sideria grows a little bit slower than Orbicella fabulata does, so even though we had the same amount of um, skeleton, a couple of meters, we were able to get back further, but we weren't able to get as many samples per year as we were with the Orbicella. The Orbicella, here we were able to get back to 1893. Um, it grows faster, so even though we weren't able to get back as far in time, we were able to um, get a higher resolution record. Um, and you can see that there's some uh, variability here. There's also a lot of coherency. I wanted to draw your eye to this interval in the 1930s. Both records have reduced sea surface temperatures during that time. Um, this coincides with the interval of the Dust Bowl, which we know had devastating impacts on crops and agriculture in the central United States. Um, this <coughs> interval right here is interesting. I will explain my hypothesis for that. Um, in a couple of slides, but the point of this slide is we're able to get good data, we're able to get a good reconstruction of sea surface temperature, and we're able to get um, and make good interpretations of the patterns that we see. The next step that we did was I took the Sideraster sideria record that I produced here and the Orbicella fabulata record that I produced here, and I took all of the other published um, strontium calcium data from the dry tortugas and I compiled it into a stacked record. So this record um, is a really great record. It is um, a stacked record of five different colonies that were collected from the dry tortugas. Um, each coral, so it has there, this record contains two species of coral, Sideraster sideria and Orbicella fabulata. Each coral species was calibrated